of asylum seekers from and through the north of Central America to the U.S. and Canada. And this emerged from a feeling in both, both of our research centers that there is a, near, a need to hear experts uh, who understand the full complexity of the phenomenon uh, to scrutinize government policies and their consequences and also to raise awareness in Canada about the issue. And today's events is uh, focused on policy implications, uh, or policy dimensions, I think that's, that's fair to say. And we're having a second event on experiences of people in transit and on grassroots uh, responses along the, the U.S.-Mexico border. And this second event will be on March 11 and 12. And you'll uh, so look out for that. There'll be uh, detailed inf information on that probably uh, in, in January available on both our, <coughs> our websites. And um, I think this collaboration between Surlac and CRS is a great thing. It's kind of providential that we're on the same floor of this building and on floor eight because there's a, a natural alignment between what we do, although that probably also applies to a bunch of other ORUs or certainly to YCAR, which is also on the, on the same floor of the New York Center for, for Asian Research. So uh, I'd like to, to thank our speakers, Tanya Basak and Craig Smith, and I'd also like to, to thank uh, an informal committee that has been guiding us in developing these events. And, and um, so specifically, Allison Crosby, uh, Lewin Goldring, Carlotta McAllister, Lily Lum, and uh, Will Payne. And I also want to thank the, the coordinators, um, with Cyrillac and CRS, Michelle Millard and CRS, and Camila Bonifaz and Cyrillac. So, um, our first speaker today is, is uh, Craig Smith. I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He's um, the Associate Director at the University of Toronto's uh, Global Migration Lab. Uh, he has conducted several years of field work about migration, displacement, and integration throughout the Middle East, North Africa, Western Balkans, and Europe. And his current Shirk-funded research looks at the emergence of irregular migration systems to Canada and their effects on Canada's <coughs> domestic politics and international relations. Thank you very much, Craig, for joining us. Thank you. Um, so we, we decided that um, Tang is actually going to go first, but I'm going to give like oh. a brief kind of scene setting of the displacement in the region, uh, and then flip it back to you. OK. All right. um, and I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm potentially speaking to a room of experts on this, uh, that I might get something wrong. Um, so I wouldn't mind if you interrupted me. Um, but just to kind of set the stage for, for what we're talking about today before I talk about my, my actual research is to understand the, the scale and the kind of recent history of displacement in the region. So when we're talking about and say we have Guatemala, Honduras, uh, and El Salvador, Currently, there's estimates that there are about uh, 750,000 uh, internally displaced people in the region, though um, some scholars say that that number could be at least twice as high uh, because of government's um, reticence to admit the scale of the problem and the also lack of capacity in the region to actually do accurate measurements of uh, displacement. Um, it's also the case that there's a growing number of asylum seekers and refugees in the region and leaving the region. Um, the the most recent um, the most recent accurate data is from 2017. I asked you in HDR why there's no 2018 data ready yet, and they said it would be ready soon. But if you look at the the relationship between the whole number that there are 350,000 people displaced internationally from the region from 2011 to 2017 and 130,500 of those in 2017 alone. If you could imagine a curve, it's an it's a increasing uh, displacement crisis and the UNHCR in a recent publication estimated that they would have 450,000 persons of concern uh, by 2020 in addition to 
uh, the 350,000 plus the IDPs. Um, and th there are interesting uh, displacement, displacement dynamics in the region as well for uh, people who are displaced internationally and IDPs. Um, one is that people are displaced at least twice on average um, and that it also has the, the world's most urbanized displaced population. Uh, so in, in the region has a 95% urban displacement and, and just to understand this in relation to other regions, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, I think it's 68% um, urbanized displaced population, so quite significantly higher. And why that's important is um, because delivering humanitarian aid and, and ensuring the protection of people in urban situations is quite a bit more complicated and requires a lot more policy coordination with states um, than uh, traditional, but, um, uh, you know, decreasing number of people in refugee camps. Um, in addition, sorry, one last thing. In addition, this is also a region that uh, has a lot of transit migration as well. Um, so the research that I'm going to be talking about in a couple of minutes, talking to people who have arrived in Canada regularly over the border at Roxham Road, um, an increasing number of people uh, go all the way from uh, Brazil, generally from uh, Central and Southern Africa, and Western Africa as well, flying to Brazil and then taking very long and dangerous overland routes through this region. So not only is it a region that uh, generates large numbers of displaced people, um, but it is also a significant transit route as well, where people are exposed to uh, quite severe forms of uh, predation. Um, and just to understand why why so many people are leaving this region and why it's so dangerous. Um, despite having only, um, what is it, like 8% eight, eight of the global population, the region, the NCA countries, account for 33% of the world's homicides. Um, and the violence is particularly acute in cities. Uh, here we have the, the absolute, this is the, the homicide rates. Uh, this is from 2017, again, this data. Um, but if you look at the per 100,000 on average, that's non-disaggregated uh, by gender, um, El Salvador has almost uh, uh, almost one in a thousand uh, homicide rate, which is, to understand that in comparison to Canada, uh, which is closer to two in 100,000. So understanding the scale of the violence in the region, um, in addition to a bunch of other push factors, uh, climate and environmental change is, is quite significant in the region. Um, just read you one figure there. Um, it's estimated that three and a half million people in the region require humanitarian assistance as a result of climatic change and ecological pressures. And in the past decade, uh, drought and water scarcity from development projects and mineral extraction have reduced agricultural productivity by 70%. Um, and in 2018, the region lost uh, 208,000 hectares of agricultural land, uh, leaving an additional 2.2 million people uh, at risk of food insecurity in, in an area that they call the dry corridor that ranges all the way from Southern Mexico uh, to Panama. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to leave it at that and then and then hand it over to Tanya, but um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, and so we decided to do it in this order. And kind of geographically, Craig presented what's going on in Central America as an explanation for the exodus and then we'll move to Mexico, and then Craig will continue with the implications that uh, the current situation has on Canadian policy and the movement into, into, into Canada through the United States. So I would like to begin my presentation by thanking Surlak and CRS uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. I'd like to mention that I'm an alumni, uh, alumna of York University, and I was in the Department of Sociology, but 
what really helped me to get through the program and get inspired and get, and, and graduate was the fact that I was associated with both CRS and uh, SARLAC. And some of the people that uh, inspired me in my scholarly research are still present here, so I'm delighted to see them. Uh, this work, the presentation that I'm giving today is based on research that we've been conducting roughly since 2012, and Guillermo Candiz was uh, listed as a co-author. Uh, he was our graduate student assistant uh, in the project that started in 2012, and currently he's working as my postdoctoral uh, fellow. So uh, some interviews were conducted by him in the summer of uh, uh, 2019, for instance, some of the interviews I conducted, and so we combined the interviews that we've conducted separately, but also some interviews we conducted together, and so this um, presentation is based on our combined efforts. Now, um, I will be talking about policies, but I also will be talking about the impact of policies on people, and hence there will be a bridge between what I'm presenting today and the event that you will, and the presentation you'll have. Uh, the presentation you'll have in March. Sorry, I can't speak louder. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, the, uh, the topic is um, ambiguous legality. Uh, and this is a topic that um, I've worked on for several years, issues with, is with the social kind of political and legal construction of illegality, but also understanding that at times the boundary between legality and illegality can be quite blurred. And so, so I will be talking about uh, migrants who are found in these conditions of uh, ambiguous legality, and ambiguous le legality here means that sometimes their status is only temporary, so they're legal today, but they may not be legal um, uh, next year or a few months down the road. Or they have uh, a legal status, but no legal rights. Or they do have legal rights um, on paper, but in reality, they have difficulties accessing those rights. So this is basically what I'm going to, after I've reviewed some policies, I, my, my last section is about the impact on the policies on the status and conditions that people uh, find themselves in. And so uh, looking at the construction of um, this kind of a blurred boundary between legality and, and illegality or ambi um, ambiguous legality, I'll be looking at um, uh, certain uh, policies, but those policies are linked to discourses, right? Because discourses shape the, the way we, we define a situation and what kind of policies uh, are put in place to address what's what, uh, defined as a problem, what is being problematized, and where the solution is to be found. So the two discourses that I'm particularly interested in are discourses of transit countries or transit migration, and the other discourse is a third safe country discourse. And these discourses are based to a, a certain uh, um, set of policies, practices, actors, geographic locations, right? So as I will be discussing the um, uh, this course of transit migration, which is linked to the externalization of border control to countries that are defined as transit countries, and uh, this course is of safe, uh, a third safe country, which is a policy, I would argue, policy of externalizing humanitarian protection of refugees to countries on route. So the two, pro the two discourses are interrelated, but I'll also be looking particularly at the role of UNHCR at creating this kind of an infrastructure of externalized refugee protection in Mexico. And I will be showing that there are cracks in that architecture of refugee protection. And because of that cracks, kind of the combination of securitization policies with the externalization of refugee protection in a kind of pr producing the um, edifice of refugee protection, which, which has lots of holes, which has a lot of cr cracks. That's what explains the ambiguous um, legal status that uh, uh, migrants have in that um, area. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the field work uh, um, that this paper reflects was conducted in 2018 and 2019 uh, in Tapachula, southern Mexico, and in uh, Tijuana, northern Mexico, uh, as well as Monterrey, 
And we also conducted some interviews uh, by Skype, interviews with uh, uh, um, uh, civil society organizations. So also, uh, you know, they're located throughout Mexico, some are in Mexico City, some are in, in other parts of Mexico. So we conducted some of the, uh, well, 20 interviews by Skype. But uh, well, uh, Guillermo was in uh, Tijuana in summer of 2019. He conducted many interviews with, um, um, uh, with um, civil society organizations in person. Guillermo also interviewed migrants, and I would have loved to integrate those interviews in the presentation. But we've just finished uh, transcribing, or we, you know, someone else was transcribing the interviews, and we're analyzing those interviews. So unfortunately, we, I won't be uh, presenting any uh, um, uh, quotes from, uh, from from that part of the field work. Not yet. Maybe if I get invited again, I will be able to incorporate that research in the presentation. Okay. So, so starting with the externalization of borders. Just mention briefly that the concept itself uh, was introduced in 1990 in the concept of Europe externalizing its borders to countries on, on route, uh, Morocco being one, now Turkey is an important a country to which um, uh, externalization of bo uh, borders are kind of um, um, uh, moved. And so um, organizations like UN, Council of European Union, IOM, uh, introduced the concept, which was quickly picked up by many European states that used the idea of transit countries and transit migration to kind of shift the responsibility onto those countries to um, deal with the migrant flow and control it so that they wouldn't be reaching the uh, European borders. And so the, this um, policy included the corpora uh, cooperation in repatriation or increased surveillance, uh, training provided to the countries en route to address the needs, uh, well, to address the needs of the migrants. Repatriation being one way that they would use to address the needs. And in exchange, they would get some trade concessions or um, development aid. Now, yeah, when we look at the, uh, the US-Mexico relation then, um, you know, we, we can see some signs of the externalization of border control by the US into Mexico, uh, going back to 2001, but an important uh, initiative uh, that really kind of solidifies the, the, uh, the externalization of border surveillance into Mexico is called the Merida Initiative, which is, you know, not just about migration, it's about, it's mostly about controlling drug trade and involves not only Mexico, but other Central American countries. But as part of that initiative, migration control is something that Mexico is expo expected to do under this initiative, and it receives funding to do it. And so in addition to, you know, that kind of a framework of uh, Merida initiative, uh, a, a specific program uh, was added in 2014 called the Southern Border Program, and that border um, specifically addresses control of migration. And so there are different um, practices that are associated that, that that Mexico expected to engage in in order to kind of stem the migration of Central Americans to, um, towards the United States. And so under this um, southern border uh, uh, program, detentions went up more than double from 2013 to 2015, right? Um, and nevertheless, you know, that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, migration control is, is not something that necessarily uh, prevents migrants from or deters many of them from trying to cross uh, the uh, to cross Mexico towards the United States, particularly given the situation that uh, Craig presented about internal displacements and um, the homicide rates, which um, really force many to abandon their countries, and so. Um, as migrant flows increase, 
But not only migrant flows, because again, yeah, I think, you know, when we look at the numbers, there has been an overall increase in, in the number of Central Americans who leave their countries and migrate to the United States, but their visibility, I think it's something else that has changed, because uh, often they migrate in groups, in caravans, and there's a good reason why they migrate in caravans, because it's unsafe for uh, migrants to travel through Mexico on their own, so they form groups and they're more protected when they travel together. Um, so. Um, in April 2018, there is a uh, caravan of um, uh, what, what was called a, a caravan, or that other people you know, prefer using the word, of, uh, word exodus, but there was a group of 1,500 uh, Central American migrants who start moving through Mexico, and of course that um, produces a reaction from Trump. And you know, then the flow continues, and uh, uh, in October 2018, there is uh, a, a larger group, a much larger group of 7,000 Central American migrants, um, um, and um, you know, after that, this kind of accident con continues, but smaller groups of migrants um, continue traveling through Mexico towards the United States, and again, that produces a reaction from from Trump, who is accusing Mexico of not doing anything to block the movement of the Central American migrants. And if, in fact, if, if anything, uh, you know, migrants at that point, you know, in, in, in October, well, starting in January uh, 2019, migrants were obtaining some documents, humanitarian visas, or it's actually uh, a temporary status on humanitarian grounds that is known, commonly known as a humanitarian visa, and they were getting uh, some assistance at the southern borders. Um, um, and you know, getting the, the, the so-called humanitarian visa would make it easier for the migrants to travel through Mexico towards the US border because uh, they didn't have to worry about Mexican immigration authorities detaining them, right? Because often when they traveled on their own, uh, they had to choose those roads, those routes that would um, allow them to escape immigration control, right? And there are lots of immigration checkpoints, uh, particularly in southern Mexico. So when they travel individually, um, they, they, they would often go through the mountains or some remote areas where they would be um, preyed on by some you know, criminals. They would be uh, kidnapped by criminal organizations and things like that. So where's when they get a humanitarian visa, so to speak, then they can take a bus and travel in safer conditions. And so, from the perspective of the U.S. administration, the fact that they were obtaining a so -called, the so-called humanitarian visa was something that was encouraging more migration, and certainly Trump wanted to see it stopped. So, um, in June 2019, then, um, uh, um, Trump threatens Mexico to, uh, with uh, trade tariffs and negotiations take place and even though tariffs are avoided, nevertheless, uh, Mexico adopts um, certain policy. It promises to uh, increase uh, surveillance, surveillance at the southern border and, um, and detention of migrants and so we see that you know, 2,500 members of a new, the new formed National Guard um, um, is established at the southern border to crack, crack, uh, crack down on migration. And roadblocks are uh, set up throughout southern Mexico. And in fact, so if you look at the statistics in the first nine months of 2019, um, uh, Mexico uh, detained um, 158 thousand individuals, most of whom are Central American migrants. But what's important is if you look at the northern border, the U.S.-Mexico border, is that in fact fewer people make it to the north, uh, to the border with, with the U.S., right? So those kind of detention practices were effective in some way by, you know, detaining many from making it, uh, it to the northern border. And so, so as um, uh, Jennifer Hinman and, and Alison Mounts would argue, 
the externalization of control, the externalization of uh, uh, border surveillance can be considered to be a violation of the principle of non refoulement right? Because essentially, you know, those who do cross into the United States, uh, those who, who try to seek asylum in the, in the United States but are pushed back, you know, they are denied the, uh, the right to claim assignment. And so that is similar to the principle of, 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 of you know, uh, violation of non uh, more principle. And so to justify this kind of a policy, and this, the, the discourse of third country asylum is used, right? Because when you argue that, if that the, you know, people are pushed back, but they have a, a right to claim asylum elsewhere, then, you know, that could be some kind of a uh, moral justification of the policy that pushes uh, asylum seekers back. And so, even though when Mexico was threatened with trade tariffs, it refused to sign a third safe country agreement with the United States. De facto, it is providing, it is kind of building an infrastructure that allows uh, asylum seekers to claim asylum, right? So even though de facto it's not a third, you know, it, 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 even though in uh, officially Mexico does not have this agreement with the United States, but de facto it's turning to itself into the country of um, asylum. So of course Mexico prides itself on its tradition of providing asylum to those who flee very civil wars and, and um, uh, violence and so there is a history of Mexico providing protection to refugees uh, fleeing from Spain, uh, civil war in Spain or South, violence in South America, um, Guatemalan and Salvadoran uh, uh, refugees in the 1980s. And, and recently Mexico has taken certain measures to expand its and redefine uh, its um, commitment to protecting refugees. So 2011, Mexico revised its law on refugees and complementary protection. It also revised Article 11 of its constitution to entrench the universal right to seek asylum. And then Mexico engages in discussions at various international fora and signs some, signs some declarations. So there is a you know, very uh, clear state of commitment to protecting um, refugees and expanding asylum. And so if we look at the numbers, um, in 2013, only you know, fewer than thir uh, 1,300 um, Central American and, and other uh, migrants claim asylum in Mexico. By September 2019, the number had gone up to 6,200, and it's expected to be 80,000 by the end of the year, right? on the basis of projections. Currently, the most recent statistics, it's at 62,000. And so here, you know, this is a graph that in fact demonstrates that trend. And so this is a graph that I want to share with you, which is um, uh, you see that in terms of the country of origin, Hondurans are the largest group, but um, uh, also there's a sizable number of refugees from Venezuela, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua and Cuba, right? And so there's some variation. These graphs are for 2018 and 2019. So the relative volume uh, varies between 18 and, uh, 2018 and 19, but definitely you can see how Hondurans are dominating that trend. So what's also important to note is that uh, the uh, approval rate is very high when you compare Mexico's uh, uh, asylum claim and approval rate with other countries, it's very high. So here, and I should mention that Mexico uh, uses um, um, kind of two designations, and so either refugees are recognized as convention refugees that they have to prove that there's a well-founded fear um, of persecution, although with Venezuela it's prima, fa prima facie, so they use a Cartagena agreement to basically um, offer asylum to virtually all Venezuelans, and that's why you see that they use the uh, um, approval rate is very high. In Honduras, they've started using the Cartagena agreement, 
also they claim, I, I don't see evidence of it yet, but nevertheless, the approval rate is very high, and here the statistics are for the convention ref for convention refugees being recognized as a convention refugee, but they also use another category, which is complementary protection, which is not, you know, for those who, who can't just, who can't prove that they have a well-founded fear of persecution, they can't provide the evidence, but nevertheless, there are good reasons to suspect that if returned, they would be um, um, uh, facing some kind of violence. And so between the two, Convention refugee and complementary protection, the approval rates are 81% for 2018. I believe it is 87 for uh, 2019, well, up till September, right? So these, these graphs are not quite 81% and 87 because the, this graph is only for convention refugees. But then, you know, by the time you've added complementary protection, the approval rate is very high. In, in practical terms, if you're interested, what's the difference between getting uh, 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 convention refugee status or complementary protection? For, for asylum seekers, there is a difference because if they recognize as convention refugees, they can bring their families over right away, not so with complementary protection. But nevertheless, you know, the applicants themselves, uh, if they get the status, then, you know, they can stay in Mexico. And so, um, so you, you, you look at this policy and say, well, isn't Mexico a humanitarian country that provides protection to refugees? You know, it's expanding its, uh, its system and it's, it, the approval rate is high. But, um, but I would har argue that uh, this humanitarianism has to be understood in conjunction with securitization policies, which the detention statistics that I presented to you earlier make it very clear. And so here I'm using a body of literature that talks about humanitarianism um, as something that is, uh, that is tightly um, interwoven with policies of securitization, and you know, I've mentioned a, a, a number of, of scholars who talk about how humanitarianism and securitization, commitment to securitization uh, on the part of international organizations or even civil society organizations and, and, and states go hand in hand, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to go over that literature because I don't have time, but I just wanted to mention that I draw my inspiration from that literature, and as part of this literature, they look at international organizations, um, and UNHCR is one of them, so that's why I wanted to mention that there are a number of organizations, a number of analysis on organizations such as the uh, IOM and other international organizations, the UNHCR, that, that talk about how care is provided while at the same time these organizations <coughs> are involved in migration management. Okay, so lo let's look more specifically at UNHCR in Mexico. So UNHCR has been building the edifice of refugee protection since, say, 2013 or so. And so how did they do it? They funded positions in the office, uh, in the refugee office in Mexico, which is the acronym for that office is COMAR. Uh, and uh, they, um, so they fund positions, they provide funding to the office itself, they engage in capacity building, uh, training uh, for uh, COMAR um, employees. Uh, they um, disseminate information on both sides of the Mexico-Guatemala border, uh, informing uh, migrants about possibilities of claiming uh, asylum and informing them and encourage them to claim um, uh, asylum in Mexico. They provide funding to local NGOs, the civil society organizations, to provide that information to the migrants who seek shelter, who stay at these organizations. And that's, you know, there is an established, I'm going to mention it a bit later as well, there is an established network of uh, shelters in Mexico that migrants, when they travel through Mexico, they go from one shelter to another. They can get some assistance, some food and clothing and sleep overnight in those shelters. So now UNHCR is providing funding to these organizations, encouraging them to uh, encourage migrants to seek asylum in Mexico instead of continuing their journey towards the United States. And they also provide emergency aid to support uh, those who decide to claim asylum in Mexico. And so UNHCR works with civil society organizations because you know, whenever we talk about kind of uh, building an infrastructure 
of humanitarianism, we have to understand that there are different uh, uh, actors working hand in hand, and so UNHCR is working with Comar, which is a uh, Comar, which is a government agency, but they, they also uh, seek um, cooperation from civil society organizations, and these organizations are often happy to receive funding um, uh, from UNHCR, and um, although some of them. Uh, are very critical of UNHCR because they understand that UNHCR is also playing a role in trying to, you know, detain refugees from seeking asylum in the United States. They try to keep them in, in Mexico, and so. But nevertheless, you know, many network, many uh, migrant shelters receive funding from UNHCR, and I wanted to mention. Um, another initiative, which is called Daruta de Hospitalidad, or the Hospitality Route in Mexico, and that's an initiative that is based on cooperation between some activists, um, civil society organizations, but also businesses. And they, uh, what they're trying to do with, the, with this initiative is to integrate asylum seekers once they receive their status, integrate them into the Mexican society and they seek businesses that are willing to offer jobs to those who are recognized as, as refugees. It sounds you know, very impressive and when you interview, and we did interview some members of this organization and they, you know, they talk about how uh, you know, this is a very comprehensive initiative. In practice, they've only placed two refugees um, in jobs, you know, but uh, we'll see how it goes uh, from that point on. So, um, uh, another thing that I would mention, so as I say, you know, UNHCR is providing assistance, civil society organizations is providing some help to those who wish to claim asylum, and aside from, you know, providing them the information, they actually accompany them to the office of Omar or whatever they have to go because often enough uh, refugee, uh, asylum seekers lack information. They don't know what they want, uh, uh, what they need to do and, and you know, Mexican uh, immigration officials as, uh, can be quite unfriendly to the migrants as well. So when they're accompanied by someone from a civil society organization, they have a much greater chance of getting um, either the financial assistance they, they get or just you know, filling out the papers to claim um, whatever status. But so. As migrant shelters are already busy providing a system, or uh, civil society organizations are busy providing assistance to migrants, they also have to deal with the migrants who are returned to Mexico through the Remain in Mexico policy, right? Or the, uh, the Mexico Migration Protocol, MPP. And so under that policy, which was put in place in January, uh, by, by the US administration in January, 2019, those who claim asylum in the U United States, many of them are returned to Mexico to wait for their appointments with the judges. And, and they would often have to go have three appointments with the judges before their, their case is decided. So the, they, they're sent back to northern Mexico, though recently they've also started putting some of these migrants on a bus and bringing them all the way to Tapachula, which is a, in the south of Mexico, right? But the idea is that they have to wait for their appointments in Mexico. And so, so far there have been over 50,000 um, asylum seekers, those who claim asylum in the United States, that were sent back to Mexico. And then, you know, what, what do they do in Mexico? They, have, they go to the shelters that are, uh, that are located at the northern border, and the shelters are already stretched to the limit, but now they have to provide some form of assistance to those, to fit more than 50,000 that are returned from, uh, 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 from the United States to Mexico. So, so Mexico is trying to kind of build this infrastructure of assistance to asylum claimants in Mexico and those asylum seekers who are returned from the United States with assistance from UNHCR. But they're incapable of, of, of providing real protection to the migrants because you know the numbers increased too suddenly. Uh, Comar is underf underfunded, it was underfunded to begin with, but also under the austerity programs put in place at the beginning of 2019, their budget was cut even more, right? So they're significantly underfunded. 
Um, for, there are 48 officials in the whole of Mexico to deal with all the cases, and there is a growing backlog. So nationwide, well, uh, so for, from 122,000 uh, ap uh, uh, applications that have been received since 2013, only 33,000 have been adjudicated, and the backlog is increasing, right? Um, and then <laughs> the support that uh, asylum seekers receive from UNHCR is decreasing. It's decreasing in actual value, also the length for, uh, uh, during which, uh, the length of time during which they, rec they receive UNHCR assistance. But also, you know, so just statistics that I found recently on the internet, uh, on the UNHCR side, uh, site, sorry, is that only 52% of 14,000 claimants that were receiving UNHCR assistance in 2017 were getting UNHCR assistance. So what about the other 7,000? How were they surviving? Right? And when you think about the majority of asylum seekers being from Central America, and most of them are poor, and so you know they certainly didn't have any money to survive on. That's 2017. I don't have any recent statistics, but it would be interesting to know what percentage of asylum seekers are uh, funded now. And then, um, oh, actually, I'll switch to the next slide, but then go back to the previous one. So here, you see there are four offices throughout Mexico. And uh, two out of three asylum claimants uh, uh, present their applications in Chiapas. And that's, you know, that's one of the poorest uh, states in Mexico. And so if they apply in Chiapas, they have to stay in Chiapas because every, uh, okay, I'm getting almost done. So every, every week they have to go back to the office and, um, and present um, uh, and you know, sign papers again, so they can't really move. They can ask for permission to move, but that's more complicated. So they stay, they have to stay in Chiapas, and where there are few jobs, and this state is very poor. And so, okay, so I'm getting to the end, and so this is my kind of slide about production of illegality and deconstructing the boundary between legality and illegality. And in here, as you see, I, I, I list a number of. Uh, um, uh, scholars who could have contributed to the deconstruction of the boundary between the two or, or introducing concepts of, of uh, liminal legality or semi-legality, uh, questioning the boundaries of citizenship and non-citizenship, you know, talking about precari precarious legality. And so, in fact, what we see is that in the case of Mexico, it, the, the boundary be between, you know, legal status and existence, which uh, is uh, without any rights, right? That the, the, the distinction between illegality and legality and illegality is blurred by the fact that you know um, asylum claimants either you know if they return from from Mexico they don't have any rights at all. Despite the fact that on June seventh, two thousand nineteen, uh, in the uh, joint declaration between U.S. and Mexico. There's the statement saying that when migrants are returned from the United States, they would be entitled to obtaining uh, a job permit and uh, access to, uh, to health care and other um, 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 uh, benefits. But in reality, they don't. You know, they don't. And so, and then Mexico asylum seekers are also entitled to the right to work, but in access, in, in reality, they often don't get the, this identity card called La Coup, which allows them to seek jobs. and. You know, just because they don't know how to, it's, it's a complicated process. And then uh, some migrants abandon their refugee claims. So when I mentioned that they have to kind of be in the same location where they apply, but there are no jobs there, they say, well, I have to move somewhere else because I can't provide for my family unless I move somewhere else. So out of 17 cases, 17,000 cases that were presented in, in 2018, more than 2,000 had abandoned their claims because they, you know, they just have to move somewhere else. And then, even if they receive the humanitarian visas that are promised to them, to those who, return, who are returned to Mexico to remain in Mexico, the humanitarian visa, according to the 2011 law, is only good for six months. It's been stretched to one year in the case of some groups, but still, it's temporary. And it would take them at least two years to go through the process so that their case is adjudicated. And so then, you know, to conclude very briefly, what I've argued here is this kind of ambiguous legality 
uh, is linked to two interconnected processes, externalization of border control, externalization of refugee protection, and it's done you know, through the assemblage of discourses, state policies and practices with the help of international organizations and civil society organizations. And uh, within the context that blurs the distinction between uh, humanitarian assistance and securitization policies and results in migrants living in very precarious conditions when they are uncertain about their future and those of their uh, family members and where they find it difficult to, uh, uh, to have decent living standards. Thank you. Also, uh, a big thanks to, um, to Sir Lyke and CRS for having me. In particular, this might be the, the, the last chance I get to say it, but um, the Center for Refugee Studies basically uh, saved my postdoc at U of T because of um, arcane rules there. I had a Shirkin Site Development Grant, and then uh, two days before the money was supposed to come into U of T, um, I found out that I couldn't hold the money at U of T and the money was about to disappear. So I sent a really frantic email to Susan McGrath, who I wish was here, who uh, sent a frantic email to the, I guess, a board? I think it was the executive. executive um, and then the Center for Refugee Studies, uh, yeah, saved my career. Uh, so a huge thank. I wish, I, wish, I wish Susan and Jennifer were here, but Michelle is here in their stead. So, um, and also a huge thanks to Michelle for the inordinate amount of emails and paperwork she has to deal with uh, for administering this grant, so thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about two, two projects here. This is a bit of a, a Frankenstein presentation. Uh, the first project is a Shirk Insight Development Grant um, where we looked at irregular migration of people coming uh, across the border at Roxham Road in Quebec upstate New York and Quebec, which I'll talk about in a second. And the other one is a project that I did for Global Affairs Canada uh, last year, looking at Canada's response to displacement in Central America. Um, and, and if anybody here is a late stage PhD student, um, this thing that, that Global Affairs has, the, it's called the IPIC, the International Policy Ideas Challenge. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get money to do original research, and then you get uh, a train ride to beautiful Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, but you actually get to present to, to policymakers and senior civil servants. So uh, I'm going to present kind of both, both those bodies of research. Um, and the kind of framing for this, um, I'm, I've been trying to think about the way that Canada, um, which is seemingly apart from the migration systems that we're talking about, fits into uh, a North American or Western hemispheric set of migration systems and how our policies affect or don't affect those given our geographic distance, but also this kind of like political and social distance that we seem to have uh, from these, uh, what I look at more specifically as forced migration or regular migration and asylum events. So um, the first project uh, that I'll talk about is, is this one. Sorry, I forgot to set my time. One second. Um, so this is uh, this is as as you might know um, the crossing at uh, Roxham Road um, near La Colle, uh, Quebec, um, and upstate New York. Um, Champlain is the is the closest town. Uh, the project that we did. This is one of those things where every time you, you, you come up with a title for a grant and then every time you read the title you realize it has too many words and it obscures more than it reveals. Um, but this is the project title, Understanding Emerging and Regular Migration Systems to Canada because we put it in, in those first months when people were walking across the border. Um, the project, I guess it's still kind of running now, but we did 10 months of data collection in five cities uh, where we interviewed 320 people who walked across the border um, over about 10 months, uh, and then 290 interviews were included in the final data, uh, and these were semi-structured interviews where we asked people um, these questions. Um, we, we tried to, through 
people's narratives and their own experiences with when and how they made choices to come to Canada to try to unpack uh, the degree to which the U.S. policy changes um, impacted this irregular migration flow to Canada, uh, how they thought of Canada and when they thought of Canada, where they got the information about the route, also how accurate was their information about the route and, and what their perceptions of the asylum system in Canada would be. Um, based on the research that I did before, and it seemed it, it, it ended up being kind of moot when, when you were looking at especially the transnational migration of people that only kind of landed in the US and then came right to the border with Canada. But the, um, experience, the role of facilitators, uh, so smugglers, sometimes traffickers, corrupt security officials, et cetera, along the route. And one of the main findings that I'll just say now because I won't talk about it so much here is that there's at least in this last uh, leg of the migration system to Canada, um, a remar remarkably little criminality uh, in comparison to other irregular migration systems uh, and remarkably little uh, predation and abuse in, in relation to other irregular migration systems. Um, and we also got basically uh, narratives from them of their experiences while they were traveling. Um, Sorry, just, just one more note here. We assumed about 300 interviews and given the scale of funding and the timelines, we tried to have a representative sample of, of people and responses, um, not by random sampling as a representative sample, but a representative sample just based on the country of origin of the populations of the people coming over the border. Um, so this is, this is just like a trend line to show you the, the irregular migration uh, over the border at Roxham Road. Um, so since April 2017, and the reason that the data only starts in April 2017 is because before then the CBSA basically wasn't uh, collecting data on irregular migration to Canada because it wasn't such a big issue. Um, and the data is actually really messy because they didn't disaggregate between inland claims and claims at the border. Um, and also because, I'm not sure the degree to which people will talk about this, but the, the data sharing between the agencies that you would assume would just share baseline, just basic data, not sharing even people's uh, biometric information or things like that that we talk about when we talk about data sharing between agencies, but basic data between IRCC, CBSA, and the, and, um, uh, the, the Immigration and Refugee Board is, is like nil. It, 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 it's, 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 uh, it's astounding when you, when you think about it. It's, it's, it's bureaucrats walking around with flash drives sharing the information with each other between colleagues. Canada. Which, which it's, a, it's not actually a bad thing when you think about it from a certain context because the bureaucratic securitization of the irregular migration uh, didn't, hadn't existed and it, it kind of uh, infiltrated the bureaucracy in the same way that it has in, in most other places, but that's another point. Um, and this is also the, this is the month by month breakdown of people walking across the border uh, at Roxham Road. And the, da the data is really incomplete. Um, I just, we just got yesterday, the, or two days ago, yesterday, the data up to October, and it basically looks the same. So you can imagine that uh, for 2019, we saw we saw these large spikes, but the the numbers of people walking across the border has basically stabilized at about 1,500 people uh, per month. What has changed, though, is the countries of origin and the the level of transnationalization of the irregular migration system. So, the catalyst for the system in the first place. Um, was when Donald Trump was elected um, shortly thereafter there was the the Muslim ban but but more with a with a more like proximate causal relationship they, they announced that they would end temporary protected status in the US uh, for Haitians um, which kicked off so you can see in 2017 the Haitians were by far the largest uh, nationality and then 
dropped quite precipitously in, in 2018. Um, and that's what you see with that big spike there in the summer of uh, 2017. Um, this is people predominantly with TPS status, with temporary protected status, who are Haitian in the US who were then quickly joined by Haitians uh, coming from Haiti, but also from third countries, uh, predominantly from uh, Brazil. Um, thereafter, you saw once the, once the images, once mainstream media really started focusing on Roxham Road and you got all the stories, then uh, the rumor mill, as it does with the regular migration, started churning. Um, and basically from the interviews that we did, the, the understanding is that people with a, a, a kind of latent desire for out-migration started making the route, and the, the, the quickest, um, the, the population to like most quickly um, kind of tune into it were people from Nigeria. Um, thereafter followed quite quickly by people uh, from Colombia, uh, and then you see also in here in these statistics uh, asylum seekers from the US and this is something that is going to be quite I think a policy challenge uh, going forward is uh, these are mixed uh, documented undocumented households uh, from the US so people who uh, there's there's a spouse or or um, children that have US citizenship and then other another who's unauthorized, um, and then the other side, and this is something that um, I've been thinking about a lot in this research project and, and having conversations with people is, is how to talk about some of these things in a way that doesn't embolden, um, that doesn't embolden conservative rhetoric around this, but a large number, it seems like more than half, are people who, uh, traveled back and forth to the US often to make sure their children were born in the US and have US citizenship. And this is like, you know, I, I, wish, I wish that whoever is feeding Donald Trump uh, singular migration studies terms like chain migration and anchor babies and things like this would stop feeding him that language because uh, it's, not, it's not incorrect uh, empirically that these phenomena are happening, but it's how to talk about it in a way that doesn't embolden that. Um, that's one of the things that I'm struggling with. <clears throat> so, um, to focus more um, on the region that we're talking about, um, that we're talking about uh, today, these are the people that we interviewed from Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, so these are the, as you can, the, the total arrivals from April 2017 to August 2019 uh, by country of origin, rounded to the nearest five. Um, this this uh, is the number that we should have sampled given the resources that we had and a sample size of 300. But as you can see, we significantly oversampled from the region. Uh, the reason that we did that was, there were a couple reasons that we did that. Um, the first reason is that because we had a, we had a, a like a drastically, drastic over-representation of people from uh, Nigeria. Um, and we ended up doing something like 70 interviews with people from Nigeria and we were supposed to do 110 or something like that. Uh, and we felt like we had accurately encapsulated uh, the, the stories that we were gonna get. And the other thing is that, um, we were just, you know, really interested in these in these populations, specifically given that it's the same hemisphere, and if you're doing any kind of exercise in uh, projection around migration potential, uh, understanding what's going on in our hemisphere was quite interesting for us. Um, so as you can see, we we basically oversampled by. Uh, 23 so we basically did double the number that we were supposed to do from Latin America to the Caribbean however uh, we failed to interview any people from Venezuela um, for a few reasons but uh, yeah I, I can get into those later in the discussion if you want to um, 
where we did most of these interviews, except for people from, uh, huh, I made a mistake. Uh, Haiti's not in here. Uh, we did interview 12 people from Haiti. Um, with the exception of people from Haiti who we, who we mostly interviewed in Montreal, the interviews that we did uh, with uh, Spanish-speaking respondents were mostly in Hamilton, Ontario, with the Colombian Refugee Association and with a couple of the refugee shelters here uh, in Toronto. <coughs> What's going on with these populations? I'd say about a quarter of the population of, of people from the, the region that we spoke with were long-term unauthorized in the US. Um, these people predominantly had narratives where um, they were living unauthorized for a, for a long period of time, average of six years, but some people as high as 20 years, um, and they had some kind of experience with U.S. immigration enforcement set against this kind of narrative and experience of, of, uh, of a growing fear um, and a growing sense of persecution inside their communities. And then there would be a catalyst like a family member or a community member would be arrested by ICE and deported, or there would be a, a raid at, uh, at a workplace, or we even heard things like um, Speci specifically with, with people from El Salvador, that, that other people, for instance, an intimate partner or an ex, uh, would use the threat of immigration enforcement against people. Um, so each of those cases were, were quite uh, unique. Um, the other people and, that we spoke with had, had only spent a short time in the US but most of them had made an overland journey through Mexico and then spent time in U.S. detention. And then once they left U.S. detention, ended up in a shelter. Um, and then at the shelter, it was, that was where uh, they started learning about coming to Canada via Roxham Road, which is very distinct from uh, the more transnational, the people who were flying to the U.S. Uh, from Africa or South Asia. Um, who had Canada in mind and Roxham Road in mind as their intended destination from the time that they left. So, so it's a very, this, this subset, the, the Latin American Caribbean subset of the people that we interviewed was actually like quite a different and unique uh, cohort among the 56 countries of people who we um, interviewed. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this part. Um, the other stuff that we that we saw in the in, in this um, in this research, and, and especially what we're seeing uh, uniquely among uh, the, we've kept in touch with the organizations and are having conversations with them quite consistently about the trends that they're seeing, um, and and also people at refugee shelters is that we're definitely now seeing a trend where people who have already come um, are having discussions with people back home or who are in third countries uh, and telling them about the experience of landing in Canada and it's kind of like twofold one there's the experience of extended limbo because of the IRB backlogs there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of anxiety uh, from not knowing how things will turn out. Um, yet it, there seems to be like in in stark contrast to kind of anywhere else where I've done this done this research, like a a, 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 a genuine kind of uh, gratitude at the the lack of hostility and xenophobia that people are facing. Uh, there's there's you know very obvious instances of you know the arson attacks on the hotels in Toronto or um, or white supremacist groups in in Montreal, but um, more often they're telling people at home that it's like it's safe to come and get to Canada through 
uh, Roxham Road and you have at least kind of like two years to to like uh, to, to regroup and rest and figure out what's gonna happen next and maybe in those two years things will get better in the US or get better at home so that's the kind of narratives that we're hearing um, <clears throat> There's also been a lot of discussion about uh, about the fact that that people from like the different different uh, members of parliament from the Liberal Party, um, different staff members from the Minister of Immigration Office or the Public Safety Office, going abroad and doing these kind of deterrence campaigns and information campaigns. Um, we've seen almost no effect of that on, on people's choice structures about whether or not they're gonna to come to Canada. Um, and if you have off the record conversations with people from those offices, they will also admit that this is basically like a PR exercise for, for voters. And, and we'll see if that kind of thing continues uh, after the election. Um, the other thing that they can't, uh, that they can't uh, do anything about is a rumor, uh, and this is something that, that I want to talk about uh, specifically. Uh, I want to talk about this. No, I'm not going to talk about this. Um, that I want to talk about specifically, and and this is going to go to the to the conclusion, and and I'm interested to hear, uh, especially what Sean has to say. I know that he disagrees with me on this, on this issue. Um, <clears throat> we've seen we've seen things uh, in the research, talking to people. We've had a lot of conversations where people show us where they first heard about Roxham Road. They'll show us social media posts. They'll show us um, basically like the agents from whom they they bought their kind of narratives and things like this. They'll show us. This stuff on their phones or in their emails and things like this, um, and it's very difficult to to keep on top of the rumors that uh, affect people's choices about whether or not they're going to come to Canada and claim asylum. Um, and there seems to be uh, very little understanding of what the asylum process actually looks like for people when once they're going to arrive. Um, and there's not much that policymakers can do about it or anybody can do about it uh, because rumors spread quite quickly. But they're often based in like some iota of fact. So this, this is from uh, Telemundo, which is the second largest uh, Spanish language news service in the United States. Um, this is a headline that came out. Uh, two days after the government in July of last year announced a program that they were going to a pilot program to regularize some undocumented workers in the construction sector in Toronto at the same time as there was still this talk going on about a million new immigrants by 2030 or whatever whatever it is mashing these two things together the headline again in the second line that this isn't like some kind of troll farm type thing, uh, are you tired of Trump, Canada needs workers and is offering residence to a million immigrants. Um, these are the types of things, not Canadian government policies and billboards in, in, in sending countries that are affecting people's choices about whether or not they're going to come uh, to Canada and claim asylum at, at Rocks and Road. Um, Which, which, is, which is something that we need to understand if we're talking about uh, Canadian government policy and whether or not it's going to have any effect on, on these irregular migration systems. The other aspect of it is that even though that irregular migration system gets most of the attention, most uh, asylum seekers are showing up uh, at airports and making claims at airports or inline claims, and most of them aren't coming from the region that we're talking about. Um, this is the claims from, from 2018. Um, if, if you notice, I, I, sh I meant to point it out here, but Mexico is not on the top 25 countries, yet Mexican asylum seekers, uh, apparently, in, in, is this right in 2019 of the second? Most, yeah, so, so this year they're, they're, they're the second largest 
number of claims in Canada, um, which, which we know from conversations with people in the government that Canada is seriously rethinking again its visa regime with Mexico. So the, 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 the previous government, the, the Harper government, uh, had a visa, a visa restrictions on Mexicans, um, which meant that there were very few asylum claims because they couldn't get to Canada. As soon as uh, Trudeau removed the visas, the visa restriction in exchange for beef exports, um, the, the number of asylum seekers from Mexico shot up uh, quite drastically. Um, yet they have a very low uh, recognition rate. It's about, the rate's like 35 percent on average over the years, basically, um, which is lower, which is obviously lower than the average. Um, but I think that kind of more troubling is the is the backlog of people waiting from Mexico waiting at the IRB and how this is starting to affect uh, Canadian policymakers' uh, decisions and, and kind of like perceptions of what they're going to do in the region. Um, and thinking of a more uh, restrictive approach to visas and, and how that then might affect a regular migration to Canada is something that we should seriously uh, pay attention to. Um, I only have a couple minutes left, so I, I need to wrap up, but <clears throat> just back to what I was saying at the beginning, what I've been thinking about is, is how, how does Canada how does Canada, which is a, a small, weak country, uh, but has, you know, is 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 rich and has uh, robust rights regimes and probably the best and uh, most well-established settlement sector in the world, um, react to and cope with uh, a neighbor like the U.S. under Donald Trump um, in IR and international relations, which is. Guess what I do? The the we have next door uh, an irrational actor who's uh, prone to retributive policies at, at the uh, smallest perception of a slight. Um, we have a migration crisis in Central America that really isn't touching Canada, uh, at least based on the research that I've done. We have a government who wants to do something about irregular migration, but has no influence on irregular migration systems unless it's going to impose ultra strict visa regimes somehow through the US. Um, and we have an impending 2020 US election uh, and Supreme Court cases around uh, DACA and the impending end of TPS, which are all going to coincide. Um, and so what I think is that uh, if I were making the calls for Canada, but also if I were uh, somebody who was going to be lobbying the government or pushing for specific policy responses, um, I would uh, keep Roxham Road basically like it is, um, offering what I think is uh, a de facto humanitarian corridor in that region uh, compared to any other place that I've done research on irregular migration. Uh, it's a well-functioning, well-managed, humane, safe place to claim asylum. Um, and it's also kind of flying under the radar and doesn't seem to be high on the list of priorities of the State Department or the White House, um, which is a good thing for Canada right now. Um, and then I would also look to bolster resettlement uh, from the region where the, where the crisis is happening. Um, just here's just some pictures of a why about the humanitarian corridor claim. This is what Roxham Road looked like in the previous winter. Um, then in the summer they built some, they built these tents and then they started building uh, this uh, permanent structure and the last time I was there um, a month and a half ago, two months ago, this is what it looks like. It's a, it's a, it, it's permanent infrastructure that is a port of entry only in the U.S. or leaving the U.S. And it's like mostly out of sight, 
there's not many journalists going there anymore uh, yet. 1,500 people a month manage to access the asylum system in Canada through this port of entry. The other thing we can do, um, and I'll get through this quickly, is uh, actually engage in the MERPS process. So the MERPS process is the, is, the, is the regional application of the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, which is part of the Global Compact on Refugees. I won't go through all of it. I'm just going to focus on this uh, last one, which are called the PTAs, the Protection Transfer Arrangements. Um, Again, this is the research, I didn't end up getting to it, but the research that I did last year for GAC. Um, Canada's ODA is 0.26% per of our, of our uh, GMP, but only 7% of our ODA goes to the region, which is in our own hemisphere. None of the countries in the region that are experiencing displacement crisis are in the top 25 recipients. Um, Canada has basically no resettlement from the region, even though we have this thing called uh, the Protection Transfer Arrangements in 2018. The Protection Transfer Arrangements are uh, that the UNHCR, in cooperation with organizations and the states in the region, will uh, basically put forward cases for people to be transferred out of there as like an additional pathway. Um, there were 785 people recommended in 2016, 150 went to the U.S., Canada took 11. In 2018, Canada took zero. In 2019, Canada will take zero. Um, and um, the UNHCR says that, oh, I don't know the number here. Anyway, the UNHCR says there'll be something like 2,000 people who will like, their names will be on a list to be resettled. <coughs> Uh, and they'll be ready to go, uh, and Canada hasn't basically called any of those uh, quotas. Um, I just want to, I, I can't just put this in scare quotes and then not mention why I did it. Um, people that we spoke with, career civil servants at Global Affairs, people who work on the ground in Canadian missions in the region, have and they're predominantly women who've worked there for their careers, have said the focus on the feminist foreign assistance policy means you have to kind of like shoehorn every type of policy to meet this uh, agenda, um, which makes policy innovation kind of impossible. Um, they've also said that, that if we're if, if as civil society or as academics or whomever are going to push for more resettlement from the region, um, that there are no, there's nobody in global affairs, IRCC or the PMO, who's willing to say something that's not in line with the feminist foreign assistance policy, um, which makes things uh, really difficult for addressing the displacement crisis in the NCA countries. Um, and I'll end on a positive point. But um, in Canada, in the, in the last six months, I've been talking to groups of people. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's now a group of people that are calling themselves the Coalition, Coalition NCA, who are making some headway in terms of lobbying uh, the previous minister's office. We'll see what happens with this new minister's office, but also civil servants at IRCC and working with some of the people who got Lifeline Syria off the ground to at least do some kind of pushing behind the scenes to get Canada to make even a minimal commitment to resettlement uh, from the region. Uh, and if anybody wants to be in touch with them or get involved with them, I'd be really happy to introduce you. Um, just, anyway, this is my, these are my policy prescriptions on what Canada can do in the region. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Tanya.